did beheadings. Uh, they took credit for crucifixions. What do they want? This is the Islamic caliphate that Osama bin Laden was talking about more than a decade ago. This is exactly that forming before our eyes. Should Americans worry? There is a real danger of somebody using a nuclear weapon on the United States. Fox News reporting. Iraq and the rise of a terrorist state. From Washington, here's Chris Wallace. Good evening. With an offshoot of al-Qaeda threatening to take over Iraq, America finds itself being drawn back into that dangerous part of the world. President Obama has sent military advisors to Baghdad, and after a long delay, he's now asking Congress for $500 million to set up a training program for rebels fighting in Syria. Tonight, we're going to look at the crisis, how we got here, what's happening on the ground, how we go forward. We'll sit down with former Vice President Dick Cheney, talk with military tacticians, and take a look at the big picture with our expert panel. But we begin with the latest on the story that's gripped the nation and the world. More than half of the U.S. military advisors are now in Baghdad, where they have set up a joint operations center to serve as a command and control headquarters for the nearly 500 U.S. troops currently stationed in Iraq. On Friday, the U.S. began flying armed surveillance drones over Baghdad, but President Obama has not yet authorized the use of force. We're not sending... Uh, combat troops into Iraq. Meanwhile, Secretary of State John Kerry met Saudi Arabia's King Abdullah to discuss what to do about Iraq one day after the king reportedly ordered a heightened terror alert in his kingdom, strengthened border security, and called up Saudi military units. Iraq's defense ministry issued this video, which it says shows Iraqi military vehicles driving along the main road between Baghdad and the city of Samarra after it purportedly cleared it of ISIS fighters. On Tuesday, the Iraqi parliament will meet to try to form a national unity government, which could show Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki the door. Chris? Thanks for that. The situation in Iraq is unpredictable, but the situation here in Washington is not. Accusations are flying and fingers are pointing. Who's responsible for the possible loss of Iraq? And among the critics, one stands out. Former Vice President Dick Cheney has launched a new offensive against Barack Obama and what he calls the collapsing Obama doctrine. Cheney writes, quote, rarely has a U.S. president been so wrong about so much. We'll talk with Cheney later in this hour, but first, let's look at the Obama doctrine. What is it? And what has it led to? First, a warning. Be advised that some of the video you'll see tonight is very graphic. So help you God. So help me God. Congratulations, Mr. President. Candidate Obama had promised he would improve America's standing in the world. Now that he was president, the world was waiting to find out how. One thing everyone did know, he'd been against the Iraq war from the start. What I do oppose is a dumb war. In fact, his opposition to the war was instrumental in his election victory. I don't want to just end the war, but I want to end the mindset that got us into war in the first place. That Obama's mindset suggested he wanted America to play a smaller role on the world stage. It didn't take long for this humbler approach to show itself. We want to reset our relationship. March 2009. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton presents Russia's foreign minister with a reset button metaphorically wiping away all that had come before. But what of the Middle East? The president himself gave an indication of where he was going in Cairo that June. He reached out to the Muslim world, acknowledging America's and the West's past errors. Tension has been fed by colonialism that denied rights and opportunities to many Muslims. In a Cold War, in which Muslim-majority countries were too often treated as proxies without regard to their own aspirations. Perhaps more significantly, Obama laid out his worldview when he addressed the UN that September. No one nation can or should 
try to dominate another nation. Yalla, yalla, yalla. In this new thinking, a forceful American presence seemed less necessary, even in Iran. Vice President Joe Biden bragged in a TV interview how the administration would end the war. I think it's going to be one of the great achievements of this administration. You're going to see 90,000 American troops come marching home by the uh, end of the summer. You're going to see a stable government in Iraq that is actually moving toward a representative government. Then came something few predicted, the Arab Spring. Nation after nation rose up, forcing out their autocratic leaders. How would the Obama administration respond? The president's signature answer came in Libya. After much of the world insisted Muammar Gaddafi had to go, Obama offered limited air support to the Libyan rebels. Some characterize this form of multilateralism as leading from behind. I don't think it's fair, and two reasons. Representative Adam Smith is a Democrat from Washington State's 9th Congressional District. One, you are more likely to be successful if you have partners. And second of all, I think in the modern world, where power comes in so many different forms, if America took the approach, this is what we're doing, get in line, we would be less likely to be successful in advancing our interests. Tonight, I can report to the American people and to the world that the United States has conducted an operation that killed Osama bin Laden. The administration claimed its most notable success overseas when American operatives tracked down and killed the mastermind of the 9-11 attacks, Osama bin Laden. Meanwhile, the president and his team were trying to modify an agreement with the Maliki government in Iraq on the status of forces that would be left behind after an American withdrawal. We must be as careful getting out of Iraq as we were careless getting in. But Obama failed to make a deal with Iraq. In December of 2011, he brought all the troops home. We're leaving behind a sovereign, stable, and self-reliant Iraq. The quotes that I saw from him on a consistent basis were, you know, this is a fragile situation, but there is in place a reasonably stable government that the hard-fought efforts of Americans have put us into a place where they have a chance. But just 24 hours after the last soldier left, Iraqi Prime Minister Maliki issued an arrest warrant for his Sunni vice president suggesting the situation in Iraq was not as stable as some hoped, and that the threat of sectarian violence remained. What Maliki did from 2011 forward was to destroy every single chance he had. Maliki basically messed up the opportunity that was there, however fragile it may have been. In 2012, with the re-election campaign in full swing, Obama was touting the administration's foreign policy successes. Al-Qaeda is on the path to defeat and Osama bin Laden is dead. But that narrative was about to be severely challenged. Less than a week after the Democratic Convention, four Americans, including Ambassador Christopher Stevens, were murdered when Islamist terrorists attacked U.S. installations in Benghazi, Libya. And there was continuing unrest in Syria where Bashar al-Assad was crushing a revolt, and where, as the world would soon see, a renewed al-Qaeda insurgency was brewing. It was less than two years ago President Obama was saying al-Qaeda was on the path to defeat. Perhaps back then he wasn't aware of ISIS, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, a savage offshoot of al-Qaeda. But like all the rest of us, he's certainly aware now. Coming up, we'll look at this militant group that's carving out its own state in parts of Syria and Iraq. What are its goals and how does it plan to achieve them? The insurgency which started in Syria has now swept across Iraq. Who are these jihadists known as ISIS, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria? I spoke with Jessica Lewis, research director of the Institute for the Study of War. She's a former Army intelligence officer, officer and Bronze Star recipient who was deployed in Iraq and Afghanistan for almost three years. Tell me a little bit about the structure of ISIS, both as an organization and as a military. I mean, they have an annual report? Mm -hmm. They do. They've actually had two. ISIS also broadcasts its 
religious activities and its governance activities. So you're talking about an army, you're talking about a government, you're talking about a religious institution, you're talking about annual reports. This is a very formidable opponent. It is. This organization is vulnerable in its inchoate state. But the more it is able to establish new norms for itself, the more it is able to bring itself together uh, and effectively govern, uh, the more dangerous it's going to become. What role did the Syrian civil war play in the resurgence of ISIS? It broke down a lot of barriers. It brought a lot of foreign fighters uh, into the Iraq front. And it gave them a chance to say that they could be more than just the Islamic State of Iraq, but in fact that they could become the most powerful uh, military organization to exert control in both Iraq and Syria. And what role did President Obama's refusal to intervene militarily in Syria play in all of that? We definitely saw that after uh, after July 2013, when the United States did not intervene in Syria, forces inside of Iraq and Syria uh, were emboldened. Do you have any sense how many fighters ISIS has? My estimates are very conservative. I think that we are looking at about 4,000 fighters on the Iraq front and about 6,000 fighters on the Syrian front, so totaling 10, to about 10,000. The trouble, though, particularly on the Iraq front, is that they are not the only ones on the offensive against the government right now. When ISIS takes over a city, Mosul, what do they establish there? What is life like under ISIS? What ISIS initially did was establish um, a set of rules for social behavior that included some very severe restrictions, particularly upon women and upon uh, praying five times a day, just very strict uh, Sharia law that one would assume would be very uh, vigorously enforced. They talk about killing, cutting off hands, crucifixion. They live tweeted a you know, corporal punishment, beheadings. Uh, they took credit for crucifixions. What is ISIS's strategy? What is its ambition? They want to establish this state uh, in a Middle East where Iraq and Syria no longer exist. Uh, they want that to be a uh, not just a safe haven for foreign fighters, but in fact a place that like-minded people come to in order to live. They want to expand that with the military as far as they possibly can. And I think they want to be the thought leaders in the global jihadist revolution. Can you negotiate with them? No, I do not think you can negotiate with them. I don't think that they need to negotiate. They have a military. They're using it. That's their strategy. And they're winning. Yes. When we come back, we'll look at the ever-changing power structure in Iraq, where ISIS is now a major player. Has the part of the country they now control reached a tipping point where it will turn permanently against the West? And is there anything we can and should do about it? Among those who will offer answers, former Vice President Dick Cheney. All that coming up. We've all seen the astonishing speed of the ISIS advance across Iraq. But what can we expect now, and can we do anything to reverse the situation? Retired four-star general and Fox News contributor Jack Keane gave me a briefing on the situation. The map referenced in 2006 on the left is really fascinating because it's in 2006 that we were really and truly losing the war in Iraq. And Baghdad was literally exploding. Okay, so all of these darker areas, this was all controlled by Al-Qaeda in Iraq and by the Sunni insurgents. Absolutely. And, 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 and here in Baghdad, you're talking about most of the city. Most of the city was definitely controlled by the Al-Qaeda, by the Sunni insurgents, and the city was just hell. So, now take us to the map on the right. Well, the surge began in January and February of 2007, and quite remarkably, by the end of 2007, we began to achieve some tangible success. And by 2008, 
we had driven the Al Qaeda out of all of the regions you see on the map to the left, because they are now gone from Baghdad of any consequence, from Fallujah, from Ramadi. In the latter part of 2008, we were actually able to drive them out of the last major city, and that was Mosul. Al-Qaeda in 2008 and 2009, in their own communications to each other, admitted that we've been defeated in Iraq. Now this is where we are today. What we're looking at on the map is radical Islamic movements that are spreading in the Middle East and into Africa. They're related to Al-Qaeda, they're affiliates. This map represents in the last four years, according to a RAND study, a 58% increase in radical Islamist organizations and the amount of territory that they control and a double increase in the amount of terrorists that are operating out there. I've heard President Obama personally dismiss this and say, hey look, if a JV team dresses up, suits up like the Lakers, that doesn't mean you're facing Kobe Bryant. I mean, are these JV teams or is this the real Lakers. Here's the problem with diminishing the threat and referring to it as a JV team. A major lesson out of 9-11 is we permitted, unimpeded, for a number of years, the Al-Qaeda sanctuary to grow in Afghanistan. You cannot let these safe havens and sanctuaries, in my judgment, grow into the varsity. General, tell me what this map shows. What, what this map actually depicts is what ISIS has been able to, uh, to achieve. In, in black is what they actually control physically on the ground. In dark red is what they're attempting to control. And in the lighter red is their support zones. This is a hell of a lot of territory. Because of the success they've achieved, they've actually grown into a terrorist army. We're not talking about a terrorist organization. This is a terrorist army. That is what's different because it fights conventionally now and it moves into towns and dominates them with combat power, just overwhelming those who are in those towns and cities. How do you explain the astonishing advance of ISIS in Iraq in the last few weeks? Let's just take Mosul. They've been shaping Mosul for two years by conducting terrorist attacks. This is vehicle-borne IED, suicide bombers, blowing up government facilities, police stations, undermining people's confidence in its military and in its police. And then last summer in 2013, they began an assassination campaign of key individuals. I think they waited to that target they believed had lost its resolve and its will, and then they launched this conventional military military operation to seize Mosul. Is ISIS in Syria and Iraq a threat to the U.S. homeland? Is it a safe haven for terror attacks against us? As of right now, ISIS is not a direct threat to the U.S. homeland because they're too busy fighting a war in Iraq and in Syria. Once they consolidate and are comfortable with their own security situation, then it will be a breeding ground for the development of terrorist activities and terrorist operations other places. And is that months from now? or years from now? Based on how this situation goes in Iraq, I, I would assume it's months from now. A threat to the U.S. homeland? Yes. General, what's this? This depicts what their intentions are in terms of establishing an Islamic State, a caliphate, that dominates Syria and also dominates most all of Iraq to include Baghdad here. I mean, this is the Islamic caliphate that Osama bin Laden was talking about more than a decade ago. Absolutely. This is exactly that forming before our eyes. So, given where they are already and their ultimate designs, what should the U.S. role be going forward? We have to drive ISIS back so we can retake those towns. The Iraqi ground forces have to do that, assisted, I believe, by our air power, and restore the, the natural sovereign border of Iraq. That will force them back into terrorist activities in Iraq, which they will continue to do. But they won't be the, the army, the state, that they have become now. That's absolutely right. We will not eliminate it, but we can push it back to where hopefully it can be managed by the uh, Iraqi military. What you're saying, General, is not boots on the ground, but we're going to end up back involved in Iraq and trying to win this war all over again. It would be in a very limited 
and selected fashion, oh Chris. But the war for Iraq is not over. By a long shot, it's not. Is it possible, as General Keene suggests, that in a few months, militant jihadists will be able to export terror to the U.S. homeland? That may seem unlikely, but they've done it before. When we come back, we'll look at how that attack on 9-11 changed the world we live in. And we'll talk with a man who played a central role in responding to that attack, Dick Cheney. We'll ask him how we should deal now with what he thinks is an even greater threat. People talk about the Bush doctrine, but not all agree on what it actually was. The fact is, it evolved over time as our nation was responding to the biggest crisis of our day. My fellow citizens, at this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. 2003, the invasion of Iraq was on, but the conflict had been a long time in the making. In 1990, Saddam Hussein invaded and annexed Kuwait. America, under George H.W. Bush, forged a coalition that responded decisively, driving Iraqi forces out of Kuwait, but leaving Saddam Hussein still in charge in Baghdad. In 2000, George W. Bush ran as a compassionate conservative and concentrated on domestic issues. But the events of September 11th changed everything. Good evening. Bush responded that day. We will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them. It was the first declaration of one of the pillars of what would come to be known as the Bush Doctrine. The people who knocked these buildings down We'll hear all of us soon. In 2001, Bush's military response was to attack Afghanistan, where the ruling Taliban harbored the al-Qaeda leaders responsible for 9-11. The president made the decision that we had to go on the offensive. William Lutie served as special assistant to the president for defense policy and strategy. This meant a complete rethinking of our strategic doctrine when it came to fighting terrorism. President Bush continued to develop his doctrine for fighting America's new threat. The war on terror will not be won on the defensive. We must take the battle to the enemy, disrupt his plans, and confront the worst threats before they emerge. It is not complicated. How do we prevent the next attack? And since we had adopted this wait until you're attacked, and then send in the law enforcement folks, the president understood that this dynamic had to change. March 20th, 2003, the U.S. invades Iraq. Baghdad fell in three weeks, but the insurgency would continue for years. Meanwhile, Bush was re-elected, and his doctrine continued to evolve. The survival of liberty in our land increasingly depends on the success of liberty in other lands. The best hope for peace in our world is the expansion of freedom in all the world. This is the capstone of the president's freedom agenda. The president essentially said that tyrannies, dictatorships, are inherently unstable. And when they implode, this causes a clear and present danger to the United States. As the fighting dragged on and casualties mounted, the Iraq war became less popular here at home. Some politicians who had once supported it now turned against our involvement there. But this war is lost. Republicans suffered big losses in the 2006 midterms, and Democrats took the House and Senate. President Bush decided to double down, sending thousands of more troops into the war. The surge was generally opposed by the war's critics, including the junior senator from Illinois. I'd express my clear and unequivocal opposition to an escalation of troop levels in Iraq. But by the end of 2007, violence in Iraq was down to levels not seen since before the invasion. Nevertheless, the war was now widely seen as a mistake. 
And in 2008, Republicans lost the White House to a candidate who ran on his opposition to ever getting involved there. The war had been won. Al-Qaeda had been defeated. Iraq was off on the process of political maturation and training and equipping its own military force. By the time President Bush had left office in 2009, I think it's generally accepted that Iraq had been stabilized. One of the architects of the Iraq war strategy has strong feelings about why that stability didn't last. Next, Dick Cheney on Barack Obama. I spoke with a man who was central to planning our invasion of Iraq and who started a new controversy with his harsh criticism of President Obama's foreign policy. Former Vice President Dick Cheney is passionate in offering his critique of the Obama doctrine in fighting the war on terror. He feels deeply this president is taking us down the wrong path. But I couldn't ignore how many feel he's the one who got it all wrong and wrong from the start. For instance, his certainty Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction when we invaded. We had intelligence that went back into the Clinton years. The first intelligence report we received uh, right after we were elected, uh, before we were sworn in, was a report from the CIA that warned about Iraq and WMD. Everybody believed that Saddam Hussein had WMD. He'd produced it and used it before. Let me ask you about two other statements. Mm -hmm. um, you said the U.S. would be greeted in Iraq as liberators. Again, that's what we'd been told by intelligence. And initially there was great uh, satisfaction. But having said that, in 2005, you said the insurgency was in its last throes right. just before it got much worse. I obviously misjudged the situation. Um, it turned out that the problem was going to be much uh, tougher than we thought it was going to be. Some people say, hey, why should we listen to him? Back when he was in charge, he was wrong about a lot of these well, things. Well, I think most of the people who say that were critics of the policy in the first place. But I'd come back to the proposition that uh, by the time we finished in Iraq, we had, as we were leaving office, we had in fact dealt with most of that problem. We had the Sunni united with the Shia and the government. We had uh, relatively effective uh, military forces left uh, with respect to the Iraqis. And uh, we had pretty well stabilized the situation as Barack Obama himself Self said. Uh, so we were in good shape by the time we, uh, we left office in, uh, in Iraq. President Obama said he was leaving a country that was sovereign, stable, and self-reliant. Right. What went wrong, Mr. Vice President? Well, what I believe went wrong was the failure to negotiate a stay-behind agreement. Um, they were unable to, to reach agreement for status of forces. Now, the U.S. military, our generals, wanted to stay behind force of close to 20,000 people, 18 to 20,000 people. The White House said no. So, what would you do now? Well, I, as I say, I'd start by reversing most of the Obama policies. I'd rebuild the U.S. military. Uh, I mean, specifically, how would you take on ISIS today? Well, I would work hard with those states that are around there. Jordan comes immediately to mind. I'd go to the Saudis and the Emirates and the UAE uh, and restore their confidence in the United States that we're in this fight with them, that we've got their back, that we're willing to make the kinds of commitments of, of resources and personnel and our own military capability so that if they do get a caliphate established in uh, uh, that region, say Iraq and Syria, that uh, we will, you know, we'll have skin in the game. But would you reintroduce U.S. ground troops? To do what? Uh, if it's to go in and uh, fight a major battle, um, uh, I'd be reluctant to do that, partly because of the confused political situation inside Iraq itself. I would give serious thought to uh, the, um, some of the kinds of things we were able to do in Iraq previously with our special ops guys. Uh, they are, are very good, very sophisticated, able to target individuals. How do you feel about bringing Iran into the discussion about Iraq? Bad idea. The, uh, the Iranians are, in many respects, the com common enemy for a lot of our friends out there. The uh, uh, idea that we're going to welcome Iran into solving the problem in Iraq is like bringing the Russians in to solve the problem in Ukraine. As you 
understand it. What is the Obama doctrine in fighting terrorism? Uh, well, for starters, they don't believe there's a problem, or at least they act that way. They've said as much. They went from a situation where they got bin Laden uh, in 2011, and then their attitude after that has been, well, we got bin Laden problem solved. Secondly, uh, he's been heavily involved in trying to withdraw the U.S. from the Middle East. And they had all the story about a pivot to Asia. We got out of uh, Iraq and didn't leave a state behind force there. He's already announced he wants to do the same thing and get it totally out of Africa. Afghanistan. Uh, the result of all of that is to significantly diminish the capacity of the United States government to influence events in that part of the world. I've got a lot of friends out there from the last 25 years and to a person, Arab, Israeli, they all have uh, lost confidence in the United States. They no longer believe they can count on us. A lot of what's involved in, in the Obama doctrine, I think, is to significantly diminish the capacity of the United States to influence events around the world world. He's not decimating Al-Qaeda, he's decimating our own Defense Department. To what end would he want to weaken our capability? I think he really believes that a strong U.S. is disruptive to what he thinks uh, the world ought to be. The United States has played a role for good in the world, for stability and peace and peacekeeping with significant military assets and the willingness to use them occasionally. I don't think he believes in that. I think his worldview is uh, different than what has been the national consensus, Republican and Democrat alike, since World War II, and that is that the U.S. has a major leading role to play in the world. Just on a personal level, when you think of all the blood and treasure that we spent in Fallujah, in Mosul, in Ramadi, to see it all go back to Al-Qaeda, how does it make you feel? Well, um, it's a tragedy. It didn't have to happen this way. I mean, if, if in fact uh, the situation that we left uh, in 07 and 08 after the surge with Iraq in, in uh, relatively good order and a stay behind force there to keep it that way, um, it would be a lot easier for the parents and the, and the families of those who gave their lives there to, uh, to accept it. Final question. Um, why are you speaking out? I mean, it seems clear that you are on a kind of offensive mm -hmm. to, to speak out about this. And you must realize, given how polarizing a figure that you are, that for some Americans, your criticism will only make President Obama more popular. <laughs> well, uh, he's going to need a lot more help than that to improve his current standing in the polls. But um, I'm convinced that the fate of the Republic is heavily involved in these issues. And if I don't speak out, I don't know who else will. And uh, I feel uh, that I can speak with some credibility because I've been there, I've been involved in all those discussions and developments. And uh, I feel uh, very strongly that it's important to do it. I believe in it. I don't need to sort of re-engage in the political wars, but I really, really believe that uh, we are in big trouble and uh, that this president's not likely to get us out of it. Is Dick Cheney's message getting through? We'll discuss that after the break. Welcome back. Tonight, we've tracked the development of the Bush Doctrine and the response of the Obama Doctrine and how both have played out in the Middle East and across the world. Here to tackle the big picture is our panel, Charles Lane, opinion writer for The Washington Post, Liz Cheney, who along with her father just wrote a scathing assessment of President Obama's foreign policy, and syndicated columnist Charles Krauthammer. Chuck, let me start with you. How responsible is the Obama doctrine, multilateralism, reluctance to use force, ending wars instead of winning wars? How big a factor do you think that is in the mess we find ourselves now in Iraq? Well, I don't think you can say it caused it, because I think these forces were welling up in some ways for a century, but certainly since before he became president. These uh, insurgents and Islamists were looking for opportunities. But I think the decision to stay out of Syria, the decision to pivot to Asia, all communicated loud and clear the idea that the United States was not uh, as interested as it, had, as it had been in the Mideast before, and that therefore there was an opening and an opportunity if people wanted to be disruptive. 
And I think it also, at the same time, uh, communicated to our allies that they might have to look for their own opportunities. That's particularly important in Iraq, where I think the Maliki regime has become increasingly reliant on Iran as we have left. But Liz, some critics say, say that the real problem was not the Obama doctrine, but the Bush doctrine as practiced by President Bush and by your dad. Uh, Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11. There was almost no Al-Qaeda presence in Iraq before the U.S. invaded. The critics would say that the problem isn't how Obama pulled out, it's how Bush and Cheney went in. Well, I'm sure we will debate what happened in 2003 for a long time to come. Uh, I believe we did the right thing. Um, but I think the critical point is, and the point on which there really is no debate, is what condition was Iraq in in 2009. And in 2009, because of the surge, because frankly President Bush, the Vice President, recognized that the Iraq situation was going in the wrong direction, because the President made the decision to surge forces in, we were in a place where Iraq was stable, where Al-Qaeda had largely been defeated in Iraq, where President Obama had a very clear and specific thing he needed to do, which was to negotiate a stay-behind agreement. Uh, now, he's trying now, and Secretary Clinton as well, are trying now to pretend as though it was the Iraqis' decision that we didn't have a stay-behind agreement. But in fact, uh, the president himself can't have it both ways. During the campaign, he said, I'm going to pull our troops out. After the campaign, he said, I pulled our troops out. And now he's sort of saying, well, it wasn't really my fault that the troops came out. It's very clear that it was his fault, and you're seeing now the consequences of that decision. Charles, how, and this is one of the central questions, how is it possible that 13 years after 9-11, all of the blood, all of the treasure that this country has spilled, that if you believe Vice President Cheney, if you believe Jack Keane, that the terror threat we face may now be even greater than it was then. Because it's a new kind of war, and along the way, in fighting a new kind of war, we made mistakes. And I think the principal mistake that accounts for the rise of ISIS in Syria and Iraq is precisely the withdrawal of American power, the one great superpower in the world, from Syria and Iraq. Iraq, of course, with the withdrawal of 2011, which left uh, Iraq in the hands of a sectarian government without the influence of the United States. While we were in there, it did not act in a sectarian way. It was inclusive. It had the sons of Iraq, the Sunni army, paid by central government. It had the loyalty of the Sunnis. It held together. When we left, that changed overnight in the absence of our influence. And that was utterly predictable and predicted. And of course, in Syria, when Obama spoke about Assad had to go, he did nothing. He left a vacuum into which the bad guys went, Iran, Hezbollah, and Russia. This is what always happens. And that's the reason we are where we are today. You create a vacuum, the bad guys will come, they came. All the polls indicate that this country is war weary, worn out. What do we do now? Does the country have the will? Does this president have the will to confront this new terror threat, Chuck? I think there's been a tendency uh, to swing between these last two administrations from absolute massive involvement with ground troops to the opposite under Obama. We won't even think about uh, airstrikes, let alone ground troops. And I think the lesson of this situation is we have to find a sustainable, balanced approach. One that doesn't abandon this region, but one that doesn't impose on the American public an ongoing price that clearly they don't want to sustain. And I think that that's going to take some internal unity in this country, an end to political polarization and a lot more seriousness from everybody about this, this long-term situation. Liz, does this country, does this president have the will to confront this threat? Part of uh, making sure the country has the will is having a president who leads. And, and I'm very worried. Obviously, I'm not a fan of this president. I, I think that his foreign policy has been a disaster. But time and time again, even when he's made a decision that he wants the American people to support, he doesn't get out there and fight for it. We need somebody who is in the Oval Office who recognizes that we face a clear and present danger to the national security of the nation and who's willing, frankly, to go out and generate the kind of support we need among the American people uh, to fight that. Charles, final thought. And leadership requires honesty and leveling with the people. The people will make the right decision if they're given the honest truth. Obama argues that unless you adopt his policy of withdrawal, the only alternative is all-out war. It's not. 
Here, the only alternative is to do what, what Petraeus did, what the surge is, is to win back the Sunnis, which can be done at low cost and politically. If we win back the Sunnis, the entire course of the war can be reversed. Thank you, panel. And thank you. Tonight, it seems there are only bad choices and worse choices in Iraq. But as the debate goes on, we need to realize it's not just a question of what America should do in Iraq. The real question is, what is America's place in the world? That's a question we'll keep debating on this channel. And that's our program for tonight. I'm Chris Wallace in Washington. Thanks so much for watching.